Chapter 90 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 90 The Meeting. After Mercedes had left Monte Cristo, he fell into profound gloom. Around him and within him, the flight of thought seemed to have stopped. His energetic mind slumbered, as the body does after extreme fatigue. What? said he to himself, while the lamp and the wax lights were nearly burnt out, and the servants were waiting impatiently in the anteroom. What? This edifice which I have been so long preparing, which I have reared with so much care and toil, is to be crushed by a single touch, a word, a breath? Yes, this self of whom I thought so much, of whom I was so proud, who had appeared so worthless in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If, and whom I had succeeded in making so great, will be but a lump of clay to-morrow. Alas! it is not the death of the body I regret, for is not the destruction of the vital principle, the repose to which everything is tending, to which every unhappy being aspires, is not this the repose of matter after which I so long sighed, and which I was seeking to attain by the painful process of starvation when Faria appeared in my dungeon? What is death for me? One step farther into rest, two, perhaps, into silence. No, it is not existence, then, that I regret, but the ruin of projects so slowly carried out, so laboriously framed. Providence is now opposed to them. When I most thought it would be propitious, it is not God's will that they should be accomplished. This burden, almost as heavy as a world, which I had raised and I had thought to bear to the end, was too great for my strength, and I was compelled to lay it down in the middle of my career. Oh, shall I then again become a fatalist, whom fourteen years of despair and ten of hope had rendered a believer in providence? And all this, all this because my heart, which I thought dead, was only sleeping, because it has awakened and has begun to beat again, because I have yielded to the pain of the emotion excited in my breast by a woman's voice. Yet, continued the Count, becoming each moment more absorbed in the anticipation of the dreadful sacrifice for the morrow which Mercedes had accepted, yet it is impossible that so noble-minded a woman should thus through selfishness consent to my death when i am in the prime of life and strength it is impossible that she can carry to such a point maternal love or rather delirium there are virtues which become crimes by exaggeration no she must have conceived some pathetic scene she will come and throw herself between us and what would be sublime here will there appear ridiculous the blush of pride mounted to the Count's forehead as this thought passed through his mind. Ridiculous, repeated he, and the ridicule will fall on me. I? Ridiculous? No, I would rather die. By thus exaggerating to his own mind the anticipated ill fortune of the next day to which he had condemned himself by promising Mercedes to spare her son, the Count at last exclaimed, "'Folly, folly, folly, to carry generosity so far as to put myself up as a mark for that young man to aim at. He will never believe that my death was suicide, and yet it is important for the honour of my memory, and this surely is not vanity but a justifiable pride. It is important the world should know that I have consented by my free will to stop my arm, already raised to strike.' and that with the arm which has been so powerful against others I have struck myself. It must be. It shall be. Seizing a pen, he drew a paper from a secret drawer in his desk and wrote at the bottom of the document, which was no other than his will, made since his arrival in Paris, a sort of codicil clearly explaining the nature of his death. "'I do this, oh my God!' said he, with his eyes raised to heaven, as much for thy honour as for mine, 
I have during ten years considered myself the agent of thy vengeance, and other wretches like Morcef, Donglar, Villefort, even Morcef himself, must not imagine that chance has freed them from their enemy. Let them know, on the contrary, that their punishment, which had been decreed by Providence, is only delayed by my present determination, and although they escape it in this world, it awaits them in another, and that they are only exchanging time for eternity. While he was thus agitated by gloomy uncertainties, wretched waking dreams of grief, the first rays of morning pierced his windows, and shone upon the pale blue paper on which he had just inscribed his justification of providence. It was just five o'clock in the morning, when a slight noise like a stifled sigh reached his ear. He turned his head, looked around him, and saw no one, but the sound was repeated distinctly enough to convince him of its reality. He arose, and quietly opening the door of the drawing-room, saw Hady, who had fallen on a chair, with her arms hanging down, and her beautiful head thrown back. She had been standing at the door, to prevent his going out without seeing her, until sleep, which the young cannot resist, had overpowered her frame, wearied as she was with watching. The noise of the door did not awaken her, and Monte Cristo gazed at her with affectionate regret. She remembered that she had a son, said he, and I forgot I had a daughter. Then shaking his head sorrowfully, Poor Heidi, said he, she wished to see me, to speak to me. She has feared or guessed something. Oh, I cannot go without taking leave of her. I cannot die without confiding her to someone. He quietly regained his seat, and wrote under the other lines, I bequeath to Maximilian Morel, captain of Spahi, and son of my former patron, Pierre Morel, ship-owner at Marseilles, the sum of twenty million, a part of which may be offered to his sister Julia and brother-in-law Emmanuel, if he does not fear this increase of fortune may mar their happiness. These twenty millions are concealed in my grotto at Monte Cristo, of which Bertuccio knows the secret. If his heart is free, and he will marry Heidi, the daughter of Ali Pasha of Yanina, whom I have brought up with the love of a father, and who has shown the love and tenderness of a daughter for me, he will thus accomplish my last wish. This will has already constituted Heidi heiress of the rest of my fortune, consisting of lands, funds in England, Austria, and Holland, furniture in my different palaces and houses, and which without the twenty millions and the legacies to my servants may still amount to sixty millions. He was finishing the last line when a cry behind him made him start, and the pen fell from his hand. Hady, said he, did you read it? Oh, my lord, said she, why are you writing thus at such an hour? Why are you bequeathing all your fortune to me? Are you going to leave me? I am going on a journey, dear child, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of infinite tenderness and melancholy. "'and if any misfortune should happen to me.' "'The Count stopped. "'Well?' asked the young girl, "'with an authoritative tone the Count had never observed before, "'and which startled him. "'Well, if any misfortune happened to me,' replied Monte Cristo, "'I wish my daughter to be happy.' Hady smiled sorrowfully and shook her head. "'Do you think of dying, my lord?' said she. "'The wise man my child has said,' "'It is good to think of death.' "'Well, if you die,' said she, "'bequeath your fortune to others, "'for if you die I shall require nothing.' "'And taking the paper she tore it into four pieces "'and threw it in the middle of the room. "'Then, the effort having exhausted her strength, "'she fell not asleep this time, but fainting on the floor. "'The Count leaned over her and raised her in his arms, and seeing that sweet pale face, those lovely eyes closed, that beautiful form motionless, and to all appearance lifeless, the idea occurred to him, for the first time, 
that perhaps she loved him otherwise than as a daughter loves a father. Alas, murmured he with intense suffering, I might then have been happy yet. Then he carried Hady to her room, resigned her to the care of her attendants, and returning to his study, which he shut quickly this time, he again copied the destroyed will. As he was finishing, the sound of a cabriolet entering the yard was heard. Monte Cristo approached the window and saw Maximilian and Emmanuel alight. Good, said he, it was time. And he sealed his will with three seals. A moment afterwards he heard a noise in the drawing room and went to open the door himself. Morel was there. He had come twenty minutes before the time appointed. I am perhaps come too soon, Count, said he, but I frankly acknowledge that I have not closed my eyes all night, nor has any one in my house. I need to see you strong in your courageous assurance to recover myself. Monte Cristo could not resist this proof of affection. He not only extended his hand to the young man, but flew to him with open arms. Morel, said he, it is a happy day for me to feel that I am beloved by such a man as you. Good morning, Emmanuel. You will come with me, then, Maximilian? Did you doubt it? said the young captain. But if I were wrong— I watched you during the whole scene of that challenge yesterday. I have been thinking of your firmness all night, and I said to myself that justice must be on your side, or man's countenance is no longer to be relied on. But Morel, Albert is your friend. Simply an acquaintance, sir. You met on the same day you first saw me. Yes, that is true, but I should not have recollected it if you had not reminded me. Thank you, Morel. Then ringing the bell once. Look, said he to Ali, who came immediately, take that to my solicitor. It is my will, Morel. When I am dead, you will go and examine it. What? said Morel. You? Dead? Yes. Must I not be prepared for everything, dear friend? But what did you do yesterday after you left me? I went to Tortoni's, where as I expected, I found Beauchamp and Jette Renault. I own I was seeking them. Why, then all was arranged? Listen, Count. The affair is serious and unavoidable. Did you doubt it? No, the offence was public, and everyone is already talking of it. Well? Well, I hope to get an exchange of arms, to substitute the sword for the pistol. The pistol is blind. Have you succeeded? asked Monte Cristo quickly, with an imperceptible gleam of hope. No, for your skill with the sword is so well known. Ah, who has betrayed me? the skilful swordsman whom you have conquered. And you failed? They positively refused. Morel, said the Count, have you ever seen me fire a pistol? Never. Well, we have time. Look. Monte Cristo took the pistols he held in his hand when Mercedes entered, and fixing an ace of clubs against the iron plate, with four shots, he successfully shot off the four sides of the club. At each shot, Morel turned pale. He examined the bullets with which Monte Cristo performed this dexterous feat, and saw that they were no larger than buckshot. "'It is astonishing,' said he. "'Look, Emmanuel!' Then turning towards Monte Cristo, "'Count,' said he, "'in the name of all that is dear to you, I entreat you not to kill Albert, the unhappy youth as a mother.' "'You are right,' said Monte Cristo, and I have none. These words were uttered in a tone which made Morel shudder. You are the offended party, Count. Doubtless. What does that imply? That you will fire first. I fire first? Oh, I obtained, or rather I claimed that we had conceded enough for them to yield us that. And at what distance? Twenty paces. A smile of terrible import passed over the Count's lips. "'Morel,' said he, 
do not forget what you have just seen the only chance for albert's safety then will arise from your emotion i suffer from emotion said monte cristo or oh, from generosity my friend to so good a marksman as you are i may say what would appear absurd to another what is that break his arm wound him but do not kill him i will tell you morel said the count that i do not need entreating to spare the life of monsieur de morcerf he shall be so well spared that he will return quietly with his two friends while i and you that will be another thing i shall be brought home no no cried maximilian quite unable to restrain his feelings as i told you my dear morel monsieur de morcerf will kill me morel looked at him in utter amazement but what has happened since last evening count the same thing that happened to brutus the night before the battle of philippi i have seen a ghost and that ghost told me morel that i had lived long enough maximilian and emmanuel looked at each other monte cristo drew out his watch let us go said he it is five minutes past seven and the appointment was for eight o'clock a carriage was in readiness at the door monte cristo stepped into it with his two friends he had stopped a moment in the passage to listen at a door and maximilian and emmanuel who had considerately passed forward a few steps thought they heard him answer by a sigh to a sob from within as the clock struck eight they drove up to the place of meeting we are first said morel looking out of the window excuse me sir said baptistin who had followed his master with indescribable terror but i think i see a carriage down there under the trees monte cristo sprang lightly from the carriage and offered his hand to assist emmanuel and maximilian the latter retained the count's hand between his i like said he to feel a hand like this when its owner relies on the goodness of his cause it seems to me said emmanuel that i see two young men down there who are evidently waiting monte cristo drew morel a step or two behind his brother-in-law maximilian said he are your affections disengaged morel looked at monte cristo with astonishment i do not speak your confidence my dear friend i only ask you a simple question answer it that is all i require i love a young girl count do you love her much more than my life another hope defeated said the count then with a sigh poor haydi murmured he to tell the truth count if i knew less of you i should think that you are less brave than you are because i sigh when thinking of someone i am leaving come morel it is not like a soldier to be so bad a judge of courage do i regret life what is it to me who have passed twenty years between life and death moreover do not alarm yourself morel this weakness if it such is betrayed to you alone i know the world is a drawing-room from which we must retire politely and honestly that is with a bow and our debts of honour paid that is to the purpose have you brought your arms i what for i hope these gentlemen have theirs i will inquire said morel do but make no treaty you understand me you need not fear morel advanced towards beauchamp and chateau renaud who seeing his intention came to meet him the three young men bowed to each other courteously if not affably excuse me gentlemen said morel but i do not see monsieur de morcerf he sent us word this morning replied chateau renaud that he would meet us on the ground ah said morel beauchamp pulled out his watch it is only five minutes past eight said he to morel there is not much time lost yet oh i made no allusion of that kind replied morel there is a carriage coming said chateau renaud it advanced rapidly along one of the avenues leading towards the open space where they were assembled 
"'You are doubtless provided with pistoles, gentlemen? "'Monsieur de Monte Cristo yields his right of using his.' "'We had anticipated this kindness on the part of the Count,' said Beauchamp, "'and I have brought some weapons which I brought eight or ten days since, "'thinking to want them on a similar occasion. "'They are quite new and have not yet been used. "'Will you examine them?' "'Oh, Monsieur Beauchamp, "'if you assure me that Monsieur de Morcerf does not know these pistols, "'you may readily believe that your word will be quite sufficient.' "'Gentlemen,' said Chateau Renaud, "'It is not Morcerf coming in that carriage. "'Faith, it is France and Debray.' "'The two young men he announced were indeed approaching. "'What chance brings you here, gentlemen?' "'said Chateau Renaud, shaking hands with each of them. "'Because,' said Debray, "'Albert sent this morning to request us to come.' "'Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud exchanged looks of astonishment. "'I think I understand this reason,' said Morel. "'What is it?' "'Yesterday afternoon I received a letter from Monsieur de Morcerf, "'begging me to attend the opera. "'And I,' said Debray, "'And I also,' said Franz. "'And we too,' added Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. "'Having wished you all to witness the challenge, "'he now wishes you to be present at the combat.' "'Exactly so,' said the young man. "'You have probably guessed right.' But after all these arrangements, he does not come himself, said Chateau Renaud. Albert is ten minutes after time. There he comes, said Beauchamp, on horseback, at full gallop, followed by a servant. How imprudent, said Chateau Renaud, to come on horseback to fight a duel with pistols, after all the instructions I had given him. And besides, said Beauchamp, with a collar above his cravat, an open coat and white waistcoat, why has he not painted a spot upon his heart? It would have been more simple. Meanwhile, Albert had arrived within ten paces of the group formed by the five young men. He jumped from his horse, threw the bridle on his servant's arms, and joined them. He was pale, and his eyes were red and swollen. It was evident that he had not slept. A shade of melancholy gravity overspread his countenance, which was not natural to him. "'I thank you, gentlemen,' said he, "'for having complied with my request. "'I feel extremely grateful for this mark of friendship.' "'Morel had stepped back as Morcerf approached "'and remained at a short distance. "'And to you also, Monsieur de Morel, my thanks are due. "'Come, there cannot be too many.' "'Sir,' said Maximilian, "'you are not perhaps aware that I am Monsieur de Monte Cristo's friend.' I was not sure, but I thought it might be so. So much the better. The more honorable men there are here, the better I shall be satisfied. Monsieur Morel, said Chateau Renaud, will you apprise the Count of Monte Cristo that Monsieur de Morcerf is arrived, and we are at his disposal? Morel was preparing to fulfill his commission. Beauchamp had meanwhile drawn the box of pistols from the carriage. Stop. Gentlemen said Albert. I have two words to say to the Count of Monte Cristo. In private? said Morel. No, sir, before all who are here. Albert's witnesses looked at each other. Franz and Debray exchanged some words in a whisper, and Morel, rejoiced at this unexpected incident, went to fetch the Count, who was walking in a retired path with Emmanuel. What does he want with me? said Monte Cristo. I do not know, but he wishes to speak to you. Ah, said Monte Cristo, I trust he is not going to tempt me by some fresh insult. I do not think that such is his intention, said Morel. The Count advanced, accompanied by Maximilian and Emmanuel. His calm and serene look formed a singular contrast to Albert's grief-stricken face, who approached also followed by the other four young men. When at three paces distant from each other, Albert and the Count stopped. "'Approach, gentlemen,' said Albert. "'I wish you not to lose one word of what I am about to have the honour of saying to the Count of Monte Cristo, for it must be repeated by you to all who will listen to it, strange as it may appear to you.' "'Proceed,' 
said the Count. Sir, said Albert, at first with a tremulous voice, but which gradually became firmer. I reproached you with exposing the conduct of Monsieur de Morcerf in Epirus, for guilty as I knew he was, I thought you had no right to punish him. But I have since learned that you had that right. It is not Fernand Mondego's treachery toward Ali Pasha which induces me so readily to excuse you, but the treachery of the fisherman Fernand towards you, and the almost unheard of miseries which were its consequences. And I say, and proclaim it publicly, that you were justified in revenging yourself on my father, and I, his son, thank you for not using greater severity. Had a thunderbolt fallen in the midst of the spectators of this unexpected scene, it would not have surprised them more than did Albert's declaration. As for Monte Cristo, his eyes slowly rose towards heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. He could not understand how Albert's fiery nature, of which he had seen so much among the Roman bandits, had suddenly stooped to this humiliation. He recognized the influence of Mercedes, and saw why her noble heart had not opposed the sacrifice she knew beforehand would be useless. "'Now, sir,' said Albert, "'if you think my apology sufficient, pray you give me your hand. Next to the merit of infallibility which you appear to possess, I rank that of candidly acknowledging a fault. But this confession concerns me only. I acted well as a man, but you have acted better than man. An angel alone could have saved one of us from death. That angel came from heaven. If not to make us friends, which, alas, fatality renders impossible, at least to make us esteem each other. Monte Cristo, with moistened eye, having breast and lips half open, extended to Albert a hand which the latter pressed with a sentiment resembling respectful fear. Gentlemen, said he, Monsieur de Monte Cristo receives my apology. I had acted hastily towards him. Hasty actions are generally bad ones. Now my fault is repaired. I hope the world will not call me cowardly for acting as my conscience dictated. But if any one should entertain a false opinion of me, added he, drawing himself up as if he would challenge both friends and enemies, I shall endeavour to correct his mistake. "'What happened during the night?' asked Beauchamp of Chateaurneau. "'We appear to make a very sorry figure here.' "'In truth, what Albert has just done is either very despicable or very noble,' replied the baron. "'What can it mean?' said Debray to France. "'The Count of Monte Cristo acts dishonourably to Monsieur de Morcerf, and is justified by his son? Had I ten Yaninas in my family, I should only consider myself the more bound to fight ten times. As for Monte Cristo, his head was bent down, his arms were powerless. Bowing under the weight of twenty-four years' reminiscences, he thought not of Albert, of Beauchamp, of Chateaurneau, or of any of that group but he thought of that courageous woman who had come to plead for her son's life, to whom he had offered his, and who had now saved it by the revelation of a dreadful family secret, capable of destroying forever in that young man's heart every feeling of filial piety. Providence still, murmured he, now only am I fully convinced of being the emissary of God. End of chapter 90